Welcome to today's uh, Miao video seminar. So uh, today we have the pleasure of hearing Alexei Ignatiev, uh, who will tell us about logic-based explainable AI. So please, Alexei, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jakob. So today I'm going to talk about our work on logic-based explainable AI. First of all, uh, before we start, a couple of disclaimers. It's not just my work. So this is a huge body of work done in collaboration with my colleagues, namely Joao Marxil, Anil Narodicka, Martin Kupe, Peter Staki, Yasin Itza, and a lot, a lot of other people. So I should thank them first. It's not just my work. Okay. And the second disclaimer is I should confess I stole shamelessly stole lots of Joao's slides. Hopefully he will not be too upset about this. So let's start. Um, <clears throat> Here's just a, like a mind map showing an overview of the area of our efforts that we made in this area. So um, I'm going to talk about XAI uh, and hopefully what should be called trustable XAI. So I'll try to cover the area of computing trustable explanations with the use of logic. I will also cover um, several approaches on how to compute interpretable machine learning models. I will also briefly talk about reasoning um, on heuristic explanations about their quality. And I will not really talk about, but this area exists. Um, uh, there is the relation between explainable AI and also verification of machine learning models and fairness. Um, so, so that you know, I have it here, but uh, I don't think I will have time to talk about this today. So let's first uh, see some motivation, what explainable AI is and why it's important. Okay. so. Uh, these days, we've been living at the time of what's called machine learning revolution. Uh, we all know what um, Google Now is, what uh, Apple um, Siri is. There are lots of tools like this. That these are smart personal assistants. They, they help us to do some simple tasks, like um, check what kind of weather we have today, and so on and so on. There are uh, ongoing efforts to develop robots that would help human uh, at home in hospitals. And of course, we all know about the success of uh, different machine learning tools that are developed to uh, succeed in solving combinatorial problems in playing um, complicated games like chess and Go. And of course, there is this huge area of uh, self drivers, self drivers, cars, and in general, autonomous vehicles. And at the same time, while I have this slide, it's not to upset the people that are working on ML, but this is just an internet meme I took online, I found online, uh, where machine learning models and uh, the algorithms to learn machine, uh, to learn uh, something, they are compared to, to parrots, like they both can learn random phrases. They don't understand much about what they're actually saying and why they're saying that and occasionally they speak nonsense. So there is these two kind of realities, they are intersecting and uh, that hopefully motivates in kind of a joke uh, why explainable AI matters. But let's dive into details. We have these complicated machine learning models. Uh, it's trained, say, to distinguish animals. It can be a deep neural network and can, it can be uh, a boosted tree or something like that. And let's say it gives us a prediction that this image is, shows us a cat, it's a red cat. Right, but we would like in reality as humans we would like to understand why this system, why it says that it's a cat, right? What kind of features of this image, what, what exactly is responsible for the for this prediction? Uh, maybe pixels, maybe some kind of shapes in the image. Uh, so we would like to understand, we would like to ask this system so that it was able to reply what is underlying its reasoning, right? And in explainable AI, ideally on this bottom. On the right hand side, I have uh, what we would like to get as an explanation. Well, this, that's a cat because it has some specific properties of cats, some cats, some, some features of cats, right? And another motivation for explainable AI is that uh, in 2016, EU uh, released this uh, well known General Data Protection Regulation or G uh, GDPR, which enforces um, um, several things about machine learning algorithms and the AI systems in general. I, and there is this core report that summarizes the effect of this uh, regulation on machine learning. And the quote says, when put into practice, the law may also effectively create a right to explanation whereby a user can ask for an explanation 
of an algorithmic decision that significantly affects them, right? And the US are also uh, quite uh, concerned about explainable AI and the existence of this, of this uh, high profile um, DARPA program for explainable AI underscores this fact. And more recently in the United States, there was, th there was this attempt to uh, legislate the Algorithmic Accountability Act, which uh, basically would enforce companies to check the algorithms for bias and transparency. And there are a couple of quotes, quotes related to this Algorithmic Accountability Act. I don't want to spend too much time about this, but the idea is that even, even uh, the countries and the governments of the countries, they understand on the high level how important explainable AI is. And here's another example in the, in the EU, uh, concretely European Commission, um, together with this AI um, expert group, they developed the, the large document on the ethic guidelines for trustworthy AI. And there are actually a couple of principles. And one of the principles is the principles of explicability where they try to detail, they, they try to define what an explanation is, why it's important and when in which circumstances, right? And I guess if I Google any country and any government, I will probably find uh, a similar document. But just another example, uh, a couple of days ago, I also Googled and I found that in Australia, there is a similar document. There is this roadmap, Australia's artificial intelligence ethics framework. And there are a couple of principles of ethics, one of which is transparency and explainability. To summarize the motivation part, uh, there are plenty of applications of ML. And sometimes ML is used in high risk applications like biometric identification of people, um, banking, if you don't get a loan, you would like to understand why, or some decision of the bank affects you somehow and you are suffering you, you need to understand why uh, and there are moreover safety critical applications like in medicine if a wrong diagnosis is made it can cost someone a life nobody wants that and of course we all know that self-driving cars are great but they're dangerous and there are lots of news about this now and this these issues these concerns they generalize to autonomous vehicles in general to aerial devices and I should say that when we talk about ML, it's important to compute explanations, but more importantly, when we get explanations, we should be sure that explanations are correct, right? So correctness of explanations is paramount. Why? Well, because we want to build trust in our AI systems. We want to trust them. We want to prevent accidents, but if something bad happens, we want to debug um, those AI systems and explanations, they uh, help us uh, get into the details of the underlying logic uh, of machine learning models. And so they make these models kind of transparent and help us debug them, hopefully, and certify. Um, hopefully, this motivation convinces you that, that XAI is important. Um, now, I should say that there are two most prominent approaches to explainable AI. One is called interpretable models, where people are concerned uh, with uh, learning interpretable machine learning models. These include decision trees, lists, and sets. I will talk about this later. Um, and the second and probably most famous approach is to try to compute explanations to black box machine learning models, namely actually to, to their decisions on the fly, right? In the post hoc fashion. I will also talk about this today. So first let's briefly talk about interpretable models. Uh, these models are usually based on rules, uh, and the, the rules are really simple. If then, if a bunch of literals, then something, right? This makes these systems quite uh, easy for us humans to understand because we humans understand conjunctions and implications. And that's why we usually call them transparent. They have this transparent design, right? And for this reason, they are interpretable and um, they, they should be helpful and explainable, yeah. Uh, here on this slide, I have uh, three major interpretable models. There are others like BDDs and some other uh, graph-like structures, but these are probably the most famous one. Decision trees, decision lists, and decision sets. Uh, here I have a couple, a couple of examples. So we have a, the well-known Titanic data set. It lists uh, um, individuals that travel, traveled with uh, Titanic. We all know what happened. And so the data set uh, assigns an individual the fact whether they survived or not, depending on the attributes of those individuals. 
namely the, the, the category, like the first class passengers or the crew, their age, uh, the gender. Um, and on the left, I have an example of a decision tree. Uh, it, 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 it is trained uh, on that uh, data set. On the right, I have uh, the example of a decision list and decision set. These are all valid examples. They really are trained on that model and they should behave um, in a kind of the same fashion because they are guaranteed to respect the training data perfectly. Okay. Um, now I'm going to talk about, I, I, it's not realistic to cover everything in this talk, but uh, I will focus on decision sets. And let's first see what this scenario we're looking at. So we consider the standard scenario of classification. So we have a data set that uh, is, is, is essentially a list of instances or examples. And each example is a bunch of attributes or features. And there is a prediction corresponding to this instance, right? And our task is to learn a model that would respect this training data set and hopefully generalize well on unseen data. And here's an example. Here is a decision set. A decision set is an unordered set of rules in contrast to decision list where we care about the order. Here we don't care about the order. We can apply any rule that fires the prediction. Say we have a, uh, an instance, for example, E1, and then we check which rule fires. There can be multiple, we pick any, and then it's our prediction. This is how decision sets operate. Uh, so that's why, because there is no order, it's really simple to interpret. If we pick, if there is such rule that fires for this instance, then we just pick it, and this conjunction of literal serves as an explanation, right? And hopefully, we, we uh, end up having a small model. That's why usually in uh, logic-based interpretable models, we try to minimize their size. Here is the typical logic-based approach to, to this problem. So this is a very simple pseudocode. Uh, we have a loop, right? In this loop, we iterate all the possible sizes of the model. And at each step of this loop, we basically ask, we encode the problem, is there a model the model can be a decision list, a decision set, or a decision tree. So we ask, is there such a model of size n, where we say size can be the number of rules, or the number of literals, or the number of nodes, if we're talking about decision uh, trees, that this model respects our training data. And then we have a formula. It can be a formula in propositional logic. It can be an SMT. Uh, it can be a MIP formula. Uh, and then we ask a solver. Is it satisfiable or not? The solver says yes or no. If it says yes, we can extract um, our model from the satisfying assignment. If no, we increase the size and we continue, right? This is the standard approach. The problem with this approach is that the encoding is quite expensive because we ask the model to respect the training data and we know that big data is everything. And if we have to deal with um, millions of examples in the training data, then, well, it will not scale. So last year, we proposed an alternative specifically for decision sets. And, and I will briefly mention this work here. So instead of considering that simple loop, we divide the process into two stages. Uh, the first stage we, in which we enumerate all individual rules, and we do so using maxat, actually incremental maxat. So we guarantee that each rule is smallest size. And we also proposed um, some specific symmetry breaking techniques for this stage. I will also briefly mention that later. And the second stage, after we get all the rules, uh, we can just formulate the set cover problem saying, uh, OK, uh, give us the smallest cover, the smallest number of rules, the smallest subset of rules that covers all the training examples. And then we can solve this problem using MIP. We can solve it using Maxat. And we also considered uh, con computing each class independently. Instead of just uh, computing everything in one go, as I showed on the previous slide, we actually tried to split the problem as much as possible. And the overall, uh, overall idea was to scale better. Right? This is how stage one works. As I said, we solve it using Maxat. And in Maxat, we have, uh, in the most general form, partial CNF formulas. Partial because it contains two parts, hard and soft, and H and S. H is, as I said, hard clauses. They must be satisfied. Right, and there are two types of hard clauses. One uh, kind, the first kind, is 
what's called coverage constraints. So we say that each rule we are computing must cover at least one instance of the right class. And the second kind of constraint is discrimination constraints. So we, we say uh, the rule we are computing must not cover any wrong instances, any instances of the wrong class, right? And the soft laws is basically, they just give us, they just provide the preference that we want to minimize the number of used literals. That's how we minimize the, the rules. And this encoding is much smaller than what existed before because the, the problem itself is, is simpler, right? We, we have to solve it multiple times, actually many times, not once, but each time we, we solve it, it's quite efficient. Now, the second stage, let's say we have data set like this, the data set before, and let's say that the first stage gives us these four rules, pi one to pi five. All these are valid. They, they are trained using our stage one, so with the use of maxat, then they're minimal, right? And then we want to create this set cover problem where we construct a, a very simple zero one matrix. One is uh, when a rule pi j covers example ei, right? And zero if it doesn't. So we want to uh, minimize either the total number of rules or the total number of literals in those rules. This is, uh, we can just opt, opt for the optimization criterion we want, subject that to the constraint that every example, every instance in our training data must be covered by at least one rule. Right? This is how say, yep. uh, so is it okay in the decision sets, the rules might overlap if they give the same answer when they overlap? It can happen, yes, and actually, um, uh, this is a very good question because I'm going to talk about this on the next slide. <laughs> oh, okay. But but we, the way we should think about these rules is like it's an implication, so that's why it's a disjunctive clause. That's why you just yeah. have. Okay. Uh, and is it important for this that the classification is like binary, or does this extend? No, it to... actually can be applied not not only to binary classification, but we consider. I mean, it works for multiple classes as well. So you see, we, we can just uh, consider the several problems, this class against all, right? So since we focus on one class at a time, we enumerate rules for one class first, and then we say everything else must be broken. Oh, okay. This is the kind of the second, the second constraint that we have in the hard part. Cool. Um, that's how it works. And then we focus on the other class and then on the other class, Okay, regarding uh, symmetric rules, yes, it can happen. It can happen a lot. So again, consider this same data set. Um, sorry, sometimes I say data set, sometimes I say data set because I can't get used to the Australian pronunciation yet, but I'm working on it. Um, um, so let's say we have this instance, E4, and there is a valid rule that covers it. If TV show is good, then our friend is not going for a date with us, okay? And there is another rule that covers exactly the same instance and nothing else. So in this situation, we call these two rules symmetric. And there is no point in computing both because they, they don't provide what, us with any helpful information to simplify the second stage, right? Because they will cover exactly the same uh, instances in the data set. Uh, and so to, to prevent this from happening after we compute a rule, we basically can just add a single clause enforcing every next rule to cover something else, at least, at least some other instance. Okay, and this works and it works quite well in practice. So I have a couple of plots here on the left. We have a cactus plot comparing the performance of this approach that we developed to the state of the art in this area, the logic based state of the art. And so this approach, this two-stage approach is represented by the lines uh, labeled with ruler something, um, and the competition is MDS2 and opt. MDS2 minimizes the number of rules and opt minimizes the number of literals. So opt solves the hardest problem because it, it's this optimization criterion is more fine-grained which leads to a much larger encoding. We want to minimize the total number of literals. We get a very small um, um, model in the end, but it's hard to get one. But this new stage, two-stage approach, actually, as I said, we just switch the optimization function 
in the second stage, and we can either come minimize the number of rules or we can minimize the number of literals used, right? And if you see the rightmost lines, the two of them, right, uh, sorry, red and green, they go uh, hand in hand. They, there is, it doesn't really matter which kind of criterion you consider. And uh, just to illustrate the performance difference, this uh, approach against the state of the art, which was also developed by us also last year, the OPT solver. We, um, I mean, this, this two stage approach, several orders of magnitude much more efficient. Right? And we also noticed that breaking symmetric pools helps a lot because, on average, we enumerate instead of almost 20,000 rules, um, we enumerate half a thousand, right? Which can be done much more efficiently. Now, I have talked about interpretable models. Hopefully, you, you, you got some idea of what they are and how they can be computed. Even though I, I admit I didn't cover everything, but I want to cover something else as well. Now, I said these models are interpretable. Let's, let's probably talk about why they're interpretable and what kind of issues there are, right? So this part of my talk is called the myth of DT interpretability. <clears throat> so there is this common belief that decision trees are extremely interpretable. Well, there is this quote from one of the papers of Leo Brayman, he is one of the gods of uh, random forests, um, who says that on interpretability, trees rate an A+. And it's not just uh, a single opinion of an individual, it's a very common belief. People really think so, and there are plenty of works that say something like this. Uh, and let's see what they mean, right? Why they interpret. As I mentioned, decision trees, like any other rule-based model, they are rules, right? Every path signifies a rule that can fire for some instances. And this is an abstract decision tree. We have some left uh, subtree, right subtree, and I uh, just highlighted a single path here. Why? Well, because let's say we have this instance where we assign feature one to value V1, feature two to value V2 and so on. And we have M features. But now if we try to predict the class for this instance, what we see is that we can just traverse the path that fires the prediction and we pick only literals that appear in that path. In this case, we have only three literals, right? In the path and that's our explanation. The prediction is made because of these three assignments. It's good, but well, what we showed last year is that there are families of functions that even if we, such that even if we train uh, optimal decision trees that are guaranteed to be smallest size, there is nothing smaller than that. In those decision trees, uh, there can be paths that are arbitrarily larger than what I call actual explanations. Let, let, let me explain what I mean. So we have this uh, DNF. You see F is a DNF, right? It has terms of size two. For example, if N equals four, then the DNF is X1 and X2 or X3 and X4, right? And an optimal decision tree for this uh, DNF is this one shown on this slide. And if we want to explain an instance like this, 1011, we will take this path, right? But we know that this decision tree represent, represents the disjunction, the DNF, and the actual explanation should be just the one that uh, makes one of the terms true, right? So in this case, it's x3 and x4 are both true. This is guaranteed to predict, this is guaranteed to force the prediction to be one, right? And this is a very simple case, n equals four, but imagine we have, we can get uh, the same function, but for n equals 1000, and then we, we will get the pass of length 1000, while the actual explanation is of size two, right? This is just one family of functions, but there are others. Whenever you get a disjunction, it's really hard to represent it using decision trees. It's kind of a known issue, but what we showed is that it's known not only with respect to the size of the decision tree, but it also is an issue with the with respect to the size of the explanations if we want to get succinct explanations. So this uh, leads me to this conclusion. So sometimes decision trees are not really interpretable. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. So we should be really careful. And it's really important that even if we are dealing with optimal decision trees, we are not guaranteed to avoid this issue. So we, in that same work, we also uh, 
made an experiment where we considered lots of data sets and we considered two well-known tools. One is interminable AI and the other one is well-known ITI. Here in this table, we train decision trees by these tools and the most interesting columns are percentage R percentage and percentage C. So percentage R shows us the, the percentage of paths that are redundant in those decision trees, right? So before I showed you a concocted example of families of functions, these are real examples, these are real data sets. And as you can see, for some examples, uh, IAI trains a model, um, say KR versus KP, it trains a model with 80% of paths that are redundant. What we also checked is that how many instances in the feature space are covered by these paths. Like if we consider the universe, all the possible combinations of um, feature values, then 75% of them are covered by these redundant paths. Meaning that if we rely on the T interpretability, then we will get um, large explanations, not re redundant explanations for 75% of the instances that exist out there, right? Another interesting observation is that if you look at the percentage average column, it shows how many literals can be dropped on average from a path. It's not just one literal. Sometimes it, uh, the number of literals in those redundant paths on average can reach 45%. For IAI and for ITI, I think it's even worse. In some cases, uh, there can be 65 literals that can be dropped. So 65% of literals that can be dropped. Right. This is. Uh, I think this is quite remarkable. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, sure. So, uh, uh, the question is about the previous slide as to whether uh, decision tree models are interpretable or not. Um, yeah, and uh, you you made this conclusion that they are not uh, inherently maybe uh, interpretable. So, um, when you trace traverse the tree to trace the decision part of an input instance instance and um, well you have a lot of um, let's say decisions uh, or nodes that uh, will make the explanation maybe overwhelming and uh, you have a very long string of explanations because there are many nodes maybe the tree is deep or there are just many nodes on the decision part so how about maybe using some alternative approach like um, uh, calculating estimating the look local increments uh, of each of these nodes to know which node actually contributes the most to the decision of, of the model. Uh, for instance, you can perhaps get probably probability of, of uh, the number of inputs passing through each nodes and then um, and then the information gain, perhaps we have find the, the weighted uh, sum of of uh, the information gain with the probability of input passing through. And at the end, you know uh, the nodes that are really important for the decisions of that uh, of that instance. So now you don't have to select all of the nodes, all of the decisions. So at the end, you just narrow down to like one or two. And you select these uh, nodes based on maybe some percentages, how many, what's the distance between the highest and the next value. So if distance is, is within a particular threshold, then you can add those nodes or those conditions to the explanation. So I still feel that inherently you can compute the importance of uh, each decision node uh, in a tree in decision part and know which one is really important for an explanation. So you don't have to provide that overwhelming explanations. So you don't need to use any, any external approach like maybe sharp or whatever to compute the importance. You can just check how many inputs are passing through each node the information gain and just find the weighted sum and know which of the decisions to actually select from this You get Yeah. So I think if we go this way, then we get into the realm of computing post hoc explanations. I was talking about what is deemed to be the reason for decision trees to be interpretable, right? There are several ways on how we can compute explanations and you are you outlined one of these, right? And there are others. You mentioned SHAP, there is also LIME. I will be talking about another way to compute explanations. They are all great stuff, they exist, but it's a bit, I think, I mean, you raise a good point, but to me, if we think about intrinsic interpretability, we should think about what the, 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 the model itself provides us with. 
if you want to do some um, computational steps on top of the model to compute y predict something, I would say this also this this uh, corresponds to computing explanations on the fly. Like it's not it's not the model itself. You don't just look at the model and see this is why it made this prediction. Yes, it's possible to do lots of clever tricks to get something more interesting, but it's a bit it's a bit different kind of story. Um, okay. Thanks. Uh, so I will proceed. Um, we also showed this year that a similar issue exists in decision lists, but to a less extent because for decision trees, even for smallest size trees, we know there is an issue. For decision lists, it's, it's not the case, but if we if we train decision lists using some heuristic methods, then plenty of them exist. Then we are in trouble again. This is an example of the same a function and uh, a decision list that is trained for this same function. It's not the smallest size, but it's a valid one. Okay, and we consider the same instance, and then we see the true five fires the prediction. What we can say is that okay, we pick the literal subroof R five, and that's our explanation. But again. We can just consider x3 and x4 because we know where we start from, right? We know the function. And that would be the actual explanation. It contains only two literals. And if we observe, if we examine our model, we can see that these two literals really are enough because they break whatever is wrong. This is highlighted in red. And they can apply, apply to the rules that fire the same, the right plus, right? And they, they really, enough to make the right prediction. And so the question is, how do, do we get these explanations, these kind of actual explanations, as I call them? <clears throat> so this brings me to the uh, second part of my talk on post-hoc explanations. So there are plenty of- Let's say just a quick question uh, regarding this. Like, it seems a, a little bit of a different problem though from the decision trees in that for decision trees, you somehow inherently had a problem that I mean, it's a tree, so it it has to start asking somewhere. And for your evil example, it's like it's somehow inherent that you won't have a good decision tree. But for these lists, I mean, I guess I guess you could have just every conjunction of size two could be a list. So this here, is... it's more like you didn't find a good explanation, but it was there, right? Um, well, I mean, if we take this instance, we see that R five fires. And typically, uh, if we are talking about intrinsic interpretability, we look at this rule, it's it then, right? We know that these, these literals, they break all the previous rules. And when we get to this rule, it fires the prediction. So these literals are enough to, 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 to make the prediction. I agree with you. This is an example. It, ha it, it has a different, decision lists have a different issue, but if we, if we don't guarantee minimality of decision lists, the same issue can appear, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the thing is that if we guarantee minimality, then it's fine. Actually, there are much smaller decision lists for this, for this function, right? And if we consider those, then it would be fine. I just wanted to show that if we use a tool like CN2 or Reaper, well-known decision lists influence tools, then, then, we, get, then we can get uh, into a similar situation. Okay, I see, thanks. Okay, so I was saying that there are myriads of heuristic approaches to post hoc explainability. What, what is meant here is that we have our model. It can be a black box model. It makes a decision. We don't understand why. It doesn't understand why either. So we um, try to ask an external arbiter, for example, Lime or Shap or Anchor, explain why this decision was made, right? These are all based on heuristics, on sampling around um, the instance we're explaining. They don't, they don't provide any rigorous uh, guarantees on, of correctness of the explanation and no guarantees of minimality of the explanation. So they compute something too large or completely incorrect. So the question is how reliable they are. I will, I will get back to this a bit later. But let me, let me start this part with a simple intuition. We have this same uh, black box model and the idea that we started from in 2018, we try to represent this classification process using logic, right? What we can do is we can represent the classify itself as a first order logic formula. And then we can also represent our input as a conjunction of literals or cube if we uh, speak first order logic. And 
we can also represent our class that is assigned as a literal, for example, class equals cat, or we can assign integers saying cat is one and the class is one. Right, and then the overall classification process can be seen as this entailment. The model, if given the input, entails the prediction pile. Right, this is what we started from. We related this uh, with uh, propositional abduction, and then we ended up being computing prime implicants of the um, classification function. Uh, let me uh, give more or less formal definitions of this. So I will be talking about abductive explanations and contrastive explanations for AXPs and CXPs in short. So we are considering um, total functions that are mapping uh, feature space F to a set of classes K, and we will be considering an instance V that is mapped to class C by this function, right? This is our classifier. And then an abductive explanation X is a subset of features such that if these are fixed to the values of our instance, then for any instance in the feature space, the prediction is not going to change, right? This, these, these explanations help us answer the why question. Why? Well, because they, we attribute the responsibility to the features of the set X, right? And a kind of dual is the concept of contrastive explanation, which is defined as follows. So uh, a contrastive explanation is a subset of features that if allowed to be free, they can take any value, but everything else is uh, fixed to the values in the instance we're explaining, then there will be at least one instance in the feature space such that the prediction changes, right? So it's enough to allow these features to change arbitrarily such that there will be an instance in feature space that is classified differently, right? So these explanations can help us answer the why not question. Why not C, why not other class? I have a couple of examples. This is the first one. So we have the feature space. We have five features, each with a domain 0, 1, 2. And we have two classes. So we did binary classification. This is a very simple example. This is just a decision list for simplicity, right? For So that it, it's illustrative enough. And let's say we have our instance. Everything is 1. And as you can see, the first rule fires. And the prediction is minus. <clears throat> And this is the set of all abductive explanations for this instance. Obviously, the first one is x1, x2 is true. Then the prediction is minus because this is how the first rule fires, right? It's not that obvious, but it's also possible to see that actually a smaller explanation would be to fix x3 to 1. Then we don't care if x1 and x2 are 1 or whatever they take, right? Because if they take the right value, then the prediction is minus. If they don't, we still guarantee that the second rule doesn't fire because x3 is not is one, right? So this is also an abductive explanation. And similarly, we can observe that it's enough to make free x1 and x3 to break the prediction, right? So the first rule doesn't fire, then the second rule fires, then the prediction changes. And similarly, we can break x2 and x3 to, to change the prediction. Right. To recap again, look, uh, this construct. So, um, abductive was basically I, I find a, a set of features, and as long as I fix those to particular values, like um, I am no no the cat had whiskers and uh, mm -hmm. and ears or something, and anything with whiskers and ears, I will classify yeah, as a cat be, regardless yeah, of yeah. anything else. Okay, but contrastive, I didn't quite get. So, uh, it's like okay, let it have not not have whiskers, but something else instead in those parts of the picture uh -huh. and then the prediction will change so we kind of why not i don't know why not a dolphin and we say okay because because we have whiskers and if we didn't have whiskers then it would be possible to 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 have a dolphin instead mm -hmm. so here as i said there is this set of contrastive explanations and if we look carefully here, we will see that there is a minimal hitting set duality between the two sets. What I mean is that every abductive explanation is a minimal hitting set of the complete set of contrastive explanations and the other way around. Every contrastive explanation is the minimal hitting set as well. Um, here's another example. We, have the, we are completely in the Boolean domain. We have five features and two classes, and that's just a decision set represented with this DNF, we have four terms. And again, the instance is everything is one, the prediction is one, right? So the, the, the classifier predicts zero, 
if none of the terms uh, is, is assigned to one, evaluated to one. Okay, and uh, if we look here, we, we work with logic, we can see that, well, as long as x1 and x2 are true, then either t1 or, or t2 are evaluated to one guaranteedly, and we will have our prediction one. Similarly, if we look at t3 and t4, then it's enough to uh, assign x1 and x3 to one to enforce the prediction to be one. Right and contrastive explanations. If we say x1 is false, if we let it to be false, then well, the prediction will change. Uh, so this is all good, but how we compute? How do we compute this? How do we compute abductive and contrastive explanations? Well, um, it's important to note that the condition I showed in the definition, the condition for AXP and CXP, is they are monotone with respect to set inclusion. It means that we can check the following predicate. If, if we're looking, at, if we are thinking about if this subset of features is an abductive explanation or not, and if it's minimal, well, we can just check the abductive, the AXP condition for this subset, and if it holds, then we can check if it doesn't hold for any of the proper subsets of this current subset, then we are guaranteed to conclude that this is an abductive explanation, right? So the general approach is like this: we can encode our classifier in the suitable logic. It can be a propositional logic. It can be, um, we can encode in, into constraints, uh, higher level constraints, MIP, PB, whatever suits, right? Uh, and then we can compute an AXP uh, like this. We start from the complete features, from the set of comp from the complete set of features, and then we drop features one by one and check if the XP condition holds. And this is the XP condition to report. And similarly for CXP, we just start from the complete set of features and we iterate and we check the CXP condition. And we do it for every feature. In the end, we will end up having a subset minimal explanation. I have an example here. This is how we compute AXP. Say we have the same uh, decision list. We have the same instance. And we would like to understand why this prediction. Right? What we do is we allow, we, we basically ask the question, can we drop feature one? Here, I mean that we allow it to take any value. Right, Everything else is fixed. Is it true that the prediction is guaranteed to be minus still? And it says yes. Now, can we drop feature two? Yes, we can still drop it because we, since, as long as we have x3 uh, equals one, the prediction is not going to change, right? Can we drop three now? Well, no, because otherwise uh, all R1 will fire. And then we proceed, we check all the other features, and in the end, we get um, an explanation that has one feature, right? And uh, let's consider the same example and how we compute contrastive explanations. So we have this instance and we'd like to understand why not plus. <clears throat> well, this is kind of probably tricky to think about it, but when we start from the complete set of features, we allow everything to take any value, right? And now, then, then we ask, can we drop feature one from our explanation? This question means that can we, uh, allow everything else to take any value, but feature x1 is fixed. And such that the prediction can change, right? And it says, yes, we can drop x1. Now we can ask the same question for x2. Okay, can we drop x2 from the explanation, meaning that we assign now x2 and x1? Can we still get a misclassification? It says no, right? Because the first two will, be fi will fire in that case. So X2 is important to keep it. Then we check, can we drop it, uh, feature three? It says no, right? Because <clears throat> uh, otherwise rule R1 would fire. And then we continue doing this. We drop uh, the fourth and the fifth feature and we end up having two features in our contrastive explanation. So in general, this is how it works. This is a very simple algorithm. We start from the complete set of features and then we traverse them one by one and um, we check if the uh, explanation condition, and here I mean either an IXP con uh, condition or CXP condition, if it holds, when we drop this concrete feature, if it does hold, then it's not necessary. We just drop it forever. Otherwise, we put it back and we consider another instance. In the end, we report uh, a subset minimal explanation, right? As you can probably notice, this is a very simple linear search, uh, which is based on division. Uh, because we start from the complete set of features and we drop them, delete them one by one. Instead, uh, we could use something like quick explain um, if we want 
to reduce the number of iterations. Um, okay, I should also say here that the key question, the key issue here is how to make these checks, right? The AXP, CXP condition check. How do we do it? Well, what we showed uh, recently and others also showed um, that for some classes of models, uh, there are polynomial time explanation extraction procedures. These include naive-based classifiers, decision trees, other graph-based models like BDDs, also monotonic classifiers and others. But in general, what we do, as I mentioned before, we encode our classifier into a suitable logic formalism. It can be propositional logic. It can be some uh, decidable fragments of first order logic like SMT. We can use uh, some constraints language. We can use MIP, PB. And depending on our choice, the performance of the extraction procedure varies a lot. So we notice this. And then when we have this encoding, we basically apply the corresponding reasoner in that loop that I showed before. This is a very simple um, approach, right? Okay, this is all, all interesting. Let's probably focus about uh, neural networks because, well, we know that neural networks is everything these days. Um, and this is where we started this uh, line of work. So we first considered neural networks. I'm not an expert on neural networks. If, if I say something stupid, please forgive me. But uh, I understand the general idea, okay? So neural networks have uh, a bunch of interconnecting, interconnected layers. And there is a distinct layer for input called input layer, where we represent and code somehow the, the inputs. If, if we're talking about pictures, then these are pixels and they're colors. And there is also a distinct output layer that, that produces a class for the prediction. And there can be a bunch of hidden layers. Um, and each hidden layer uh, can be viewed as a block. And the blocks are interconnected, but there is no connection inside the block, right? So. Uh, there is this single signal propagation from the previous block to the next one, and then to the next one, and there is some recomputation of the uh, of the activity of the neurons. So each hidden layer is represented by a number of neurons or units, and each unit, um, once it, it gets some something received from the previous layer, and there is some computation done, and uh, there is a value, and then the, the system decides whether or not this neuron is activated and uh, passes something to the next block. And this is decided by this ReLU activation function. And there's really re ReLU activation functions are rectified linear units. And I have them shown here on the right hand side of the slide. <clears throat> Basically, it's just a piece plus wise linear function. If X is negative, then the function outputs zero. Otherwise, it output, outputs X, right? And this is, again, an, an algebraic representation of what each block does. We have this matrix A multiplied by um, an input vector X, and there is a bias um, added on top of that. And each unit is represented by a rectifier um, ReLU function applied to, to X prime, right? And there is this encoding. It was developed not by us. It's, it was known. So it was developed, uh, as far as I know, in 2018. Uh, so this encoding <clears throat> translate the translates the process into MIP, where they, they represent the matrix multiplication basically just as, as this sum. A, I, J's are co coefficients, they are known, X, J's are uh, variables. And the key to, of this encoding is that they introduce these <clears throat> S variables and indicator variables there. They help us uh, to deal with uh, the, to, to encode the real U function. Okay, I have an example here of how, it, uh, how this works. So this on the left, <clears throat> uh, I have a neural network that has just one very simple hidden layer and the function, the neural network computes X1 or X2. That's a very simple disjunction. If we look at the truth table here, believe me, this is what it does. If we look here carefully, we will see that yes, output O, really corresponds to the disjunction, right? <clears throat> and so this is how it, it can be computed using a neural network. <clears throat> the weights for x1 and x2 in the sum are both one. Um, if you can see it here. <clears throat> um, and then <clears throat> we apply the bias is minus 0 0.5 and the output is defined by the 
even an alpha operator here, because it, we are considering just binary classification, there is no need to consider the argmax function. <clears throat> and the encoding that I showed before, the known encoding is this one, right? We just literally write down these constraint and constraints and we can use a MIP solver and in, in we use CPLEX, you can use Kurobi or something like this, <clears throat> something else, to reason about this formula. Let's say now that we have an instance x1 equals one. The instance is shown here. <clears throat> Let's say x1 equals one and x2 equals zero, right? Since we have the disjunction, the prediction is one. And the explanation for this prediction should be just x1. Right? We don't care about x2 because it's zero anyway. It doesn't contribute to the function being one. So this is how it, it can be computed, shown on the left, right? If we replace x, if we assign x1 by one and x2 by zero, then the only way to satisfy the constraint would be to assign y uh, to 0 0.5, s to zero, and there will be the corresponding value for the indicated variable. <clears throat> the output, since it's the if-then-else operator, will be assigned to one, right? Now let's check what kind of exp explanation we can extract. So since this is <clears throat> a very simple, sorry, this junction, only two, variables our general algorithm would drop the first feature x1 and check if there is a misclassification right <clears throat> features are boolean it means that if we drop it we allow it to take any value and the only possible value besides one is zero right this is what we checked here and if we check uh, the instance zero zero we see that the prediction would be zero Right, so there is a misclassification possible. So X1 is important for the prediction. We just make a call to the CIP, to the MIP solvers, say CIPLEX, and it says no. Um, oh, actually it says yes, but the class is different. <clears throat> and then from this fact, we conclude that uh, feature X1 is important. Now, if we check the second feature, we again, there is just one possibility. <clears throat> Uh, which is uh, to consider instance one one, and in this case <clears throat> we call simplex again, and this is okay. This is satisfiable, and the output is one, <clears throat> and that's the only output possible. Which means that x two is not important; it doesn't contribute to the prediction, so we just exclude it. This is how it works. Uh, sorry, um, <clears throat> this table shows some results that we got in two thousand eighteen, which was published in two thousand. 19, but um, where we consider this encoding, as I mentioned before, it's not ours, uh, but we implemented this encoding for really based neural networks, uh, and we encoded it in, into MIP and SMT, <coughs> same encoding. And there are several con um, conclusions to make. First of all, that this is the number of uh, features in these data sets, not, not too large. And the first observation to make is that uh, computing subset minimal explanations <clears throat> is much cheaper than computing cardinality minimal explanations. Cardinality or smallest size is really hard to compute. The second observation we made is that MIP works in general much better than SMT. I don't know what the status quo is now, but at that stage, we tried, I think, YX, it was the best. Z3 was a bit worse than YX, and CPLEX uh, outperformed all, all SMT solvers we tried. And the final observation I wanted to make here is that it doesn't really make much sense to compute <clears throat> cardinality minimal explanations because they don't contribute much, right? They don't, we don't benefit a lot because the size of subset minimal explanations is often very close to smallest size. So it doesn't really matter if, if uh, they are cheap to compute, that's probably better to, to do. Here I have uh, an efficacy map, which I stole from Zhuao. <clears throat> Uh, it just uh, concludes various efforts uh, we and other people made in this area where we try to see how hard it is to compute explanations for different families of classifiers. Some of the classifiers, as I mentioned before, allow for um, polynomial time procedures for explanation extraction. In general, the problem is hard, <clears throat> but sometimes it's effective in practice because, for instance, random forest decision lists and uh, boosted trees, sorry, not boosted trees, but random forest decision lists, it can be, they can be encoded in the propositional logic. And then we are in the realm of subsolvers and they are known to be extremely efficient. 
boosted trees <clears throat> can be encoded naturally to SMT and SMT works well in that case as well. So we, we were able to um, explain reasonably sized models, but it's not the case for neural networks and Bayesian networks. Uh, so, well, our experience is that we can only consider some very small, smallish examples, only small <clears throat> uh, uh, neural networks. I think we considered only one hidden layer, if I'm not mistaken, and like uh, 15 neurons in, in that layer. So really toy examples only. Uh, if we consider something larger, then it doesn't scale, even me. So uh, this concludes this part uh, on computing formal explanations. So what else can we do with logic? Well, we can actually <coughs> compute, sorry, assess, we can reason about heuristic explanations and we can assess their quality. So let's consider this boosted tree. So it has seven classes. Uh, sorry, the data set is the zoo animal classification data set. It has seven classes and say this boosted tree <coughs> is trained. It's actually a valid boosted tree trained with XGBoost. And let's say we have this instance, uh, a bunch of features and the class assigned by this model is reptile, right? And if we run a well-known a heuristic explainer anchor, it will say, okay, the prediction is made because this animal doesn't have hair, there is no milk, no teeth, and no fins. That's why it's reptile. But if we uh, look at the data set itself, <clears throat> we don't have to think a lot, and it's easy. We just look at the data set and we see there is another instance there which has these same features assigned this way no hair, no milk, no teeth, no fins, but the class is amphibian, right? How can we do this in general? <clears throat> How can we see if explanations are unsound, right? We have this heuristic explanation H. What we can do, we can reason, we, we can decide if this formula is true, right? If we assign these feature values as they are in the explanation, <clears throat> but there will be an instance in the feature space that is classified differently. Right? And this is actually um, the negation of the AXP condition. Here, it's important to mention that there can be not just one such instance that violates the explanation, but there can be many, right? Uh, what else can we do with uh, the formal approach that we develop? Well, if we get an, an incorrect explanation, what we can, we, we, can, we can start from it, and then we, construct, we can construct another explanation that is guaranteed to be correct and subset minimal. And we did that as well. We did that exercise, and this is an example. We start from the incorrect explanation we got from Anchor, and then we corrected it. Now this is bulletproof. And we made this general experiment where we consider a heuristic explanation. We check if it's valid or not, <clears throat> meaning that if there is a counterexample in the feature space, <clears throat> if it's uh, not valid, we repair it, but we report it to be incorrect. If it's valid, then we check if it's minimal or not. If it's minimal, then it's fine, it's correct. If it's not minimal, so we were able to um, reduce it further, then we say it's redundant. <clears throat> And here is the result of our experiment. We considered uh, five well-known data sets considered in the area of explainability and model fairness. <clears throat> and we considered these three major players in the area, Lime, Anchor, and Chow. <clears throat> As you can see, uh, uh, each column shows the percentage of explanations that are um, deemed uh, reported to be correct and correct or redundant. <clears throat> As you can see, for example, if, if you focus on Anchor for the German data set, 99.7% sorry, of explanations are not correct, right? And for Lime and Sharp, it's not much better, right? There are other data sets for which on average, we get 94 of uh, explanation, percent of explanations for Lime and correct and 86 almost percent for Sharp. There are also a bunch of redundant explanations and not many are actually correct, which is kind of sad. I should also say that there are data sets like in this example here in the table data set landing for which all these approaches perform quite well. It's so kind I'm, of... Question. Sorry? Yeah, so I'm, I'm just wondering like, how do you determine if an explanation is correct or incorrect? 
Um, I have just mentioned it before. Uh, we check if there is an instance in the feature space that is classified differently, but it, it is covered by the explanation. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, so the question is, should we trust these explanations, these approaches, or I would say probably not, at least I would not <clears throat> bank on it. Okay, so we didn't stop there, we went further and what we did, instead of saying, okay, it's incorrect because there is just <clears throat> a single counter example, we try to assess how many counter examples there exist in the feature space, right? This gives us a better idea of how precise the explanations are. So we have this formula, we know that there is a counter example, there is this X, <clears throat> but how many other, right? In this case, we can apply approximate model count. And we did this experiment, we, in this experiment, we considered the uh, DNNs, binarized neural networks, and we only focused on anchor. Um, <clears throat> and we made two experiments. We considered unconstrained feature space where we allow the counter examples to be taken from anywhere in the feature space. And the second experiment was to consider a constrained feature space where counter examples were allowed to be taken only in if they are close to the instance being explained, right? And here we compare our precision measured by uh, a well-known mod model counter approximate C, developed as far as I remember by Kuldiv and his colleagues. <clears throat> and we compare it against the precision as reported by Anchor itself. So Anchor, as you can see, it says, okay, my, my explanations have precision 99%. I'm confident about this. And our estimate was much lower in both cases, in uh, unconstrained feature space and constrained feature space, <clears throat> which underscores uh, the issue, right? That these, these uh, explanations they may perform well in some cases, but in some other cases, they may fail miserably. And well, you never know. So what is the, the, the number for approximacy? It's like the among all, okay, among so all the, instances matching this anchor set, 67% yeah, so of ask, them are adults, <clears throat> if you look at the first line. Yeah. Give me an instance. Actually, we count the number of instances that match the explanation. Uh -huh. This will be our <clears throat> denominator, yes. right? And the numerator will be the number of instances that match and have the same plus. Yes. Okay. That would be the precision. How we yes. measure. It. Okay. And since you've you've so you and you have translated this to to logic, these are just yeah, we, two we different used, set. I mean, these are two different formulas, and you're looking for the number of satisfying assignments uh, among the, the instances yeah. in your data set. Okay. Yeah, we can fit it with uh, with an instance being explained, and then there will be other various counter examples counted. If we fit another instance, it will obviously compute another number. Mm -hmm. This is how we do it. Yes. Um, <clears throat> That concludes my talk. Uh, I should say, I hope that I convinced everybody who attended the talk that XAI is crucial these days, and it's going to be even more important in the nearest future. There are plenty of use cases for logic in explainable AI. I talked about interpretable models and how to use logic for, the, for in that case. I also talked about computing post hoc explanations and how to apply logic there as well to compute uh, rigorous explanations, right? That, that they are guaranteed to be uh, correct and subset minimal. I didn't talk about verification of ML models, but this area exists and there people apply logic as well, of course, and that area is huge. Um, <clears throat> here, I wanted to mention a couple of challenges. There are plenty, but I just wanted to, uh, to mention a few. Uh, first of all, there is this issue of scalability. Since we rely on, on, reason, on the reasoning power of our oracles, SAT solvers, PV solvers, CP solvers, whatever solvers there are, we are at the mercy of their efficiency, right? And it's okay for decision lists, decision trees, even boosted trees and random forests. But if we try to explain neural networks, we are in trouble because we can only consider small uh, neural networks. So we should really think of developing uh, much more efficient reasoners. The second challenge is, 
while not all explanations are equally good. It means that a single instance can have a thousand of explanations if we enumerate them. And some are, are great for a user, they make sense, and, but, some, but some aren't, right? They make no sense. Um, I, I didn't have examples here to show, but it happens in practice. And just the fact that there are too many is a problem. So there is this emerging area of constrained explanations where you try to apply a similar approach, but you have some background knowledge about the universe. And <clears throat> applying this technique allows you to reduce the number of explanations, but also the number of their size. And I know about one core report in this area, but hopefully there will be more papers on this soon. And finally, I wanted to mention one um, line of work that I don't know anything about, if, if there is anything on this or not. If we say <clears throat> computer explanations successfully and we see that there is a flaw in our model, it makes decisions using a bias or there is just some wrong predictions made, how do we fix it? Is there a way to repair the model based on the explanations that we got? This is kind of a very exciting question to me. And um, I just wanted to mention it here as the concluding remark. Um, that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much. I will be happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Alexei, for a wonderful talk. Uh, yeah, so let's open up the floor for, for questions. Um, while people are thinking, let me, you, you already mentioned the performance issues, like how, so, so mm -hmm. could you elaborate a little bit on, on how close you would be for different types of problems to actually getting this to scale to sizes that people care about? I mean, it seems like you use SAT solvers, you also use MaxSat. For your analysis of neural networks, I guess you have to use like really MIP solvers. Like, can yeah, you say anything? We use and, and, it's, it, and it seemed like there you had the most problems with performance or? Yes, yes, this is true. Your understanding is totally correct. Uh, we tried neural um, MIP solvers and also SMT solvers. It was back in 2018. Uh, honestly, I haven't tried a recent SMT solvers these days and I haven't tried um, modern versions of uh, CPLEX or Groby. <clears throat> so I'm not really sure how they perform these days. I also know that there are there is promising work <clears throat> in the area of verification where they try to develop bespoke algorithms, bespoke oracles that tar target specifically, say, ReLU-based neural networks. Uh, there is this well-known work of ReLuplex, uh, and the claimed uh, performance is quite significant. I know there are all lots of other approaches developed after Relublex, like Marabu and um, Venus. <clears throat> there are several work groups that work on this, and there is actually a competition of these solvers. So uh, no nothing prevents us in the area of XAI to apply the same reasoners instead of MIP, instead of SMT. We can try to apply those reasoners and probably they will perform better. But currently we haven't tried them. Um, <clears throat> it would be interesting to see, but yes, in, in my experience, what we got before, uh, performance was not great. So some of the data you had on the heuristic explanations were suggesting that, I mean, if, if you're 99% wrong, then that's not a very good heuristic. So what's the reaction from, from the machine learning side? I mean, are, are people paying attention or, or, they're, or this is somehow not so relevant for them? Or like, what are the uh, reactions? You mean, you mean that part, that piece of work where we showed that amazing table of incorrect explanations? Yeah. Well, that work was never published. That's the funny part of the story. <clears throat> we tried several times and it, it never got accepted. So the ML community doesn't want to hear this, which is understandable. So I actually had a question maybe coming from the same. So I'm coming from the ML community. <laughs> 
Yeah, so in what you did, you took this realizable case and you sort of completely ignored the statistics, completely ignored generalization, and they, you know you try to fit all the instances in your data set. Um, so do you think there is any hope to generalize it to cases where, you know, the real machine learning cases where you you have to compromise between making labeling all the data set the way it is and the generalization on new points? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the, the comment about generalization. You see, when we encode the, the model into a, a logic formalism, that logic formalism, that formula, it captures the behavior of the model on the entire feature space, right? So uh, if we say this is an explanation and it's correct, it means that there is no feature instance in the feature space, even in unseen data, that would be classified, that would break this explanation, <clears throat> right? Uh, another comment is that we didn't take into account the statistics, the, the, like the, the distribution, right? I guess this is what you mean. Like not, not all combinations are possible in reality, right? And we don't have a way to take this into account. It is true. This is a valid comment. So when we say that some explanation is incorrect, <clears throat> it, it may happen that what we return is a counterexample, while does not actually represents the reality, right? This counterexample may be stupid and the combination of features that we report doesn't, doesn't happen in practice. That's what I mean. Uh, that is why I believe this area of constrained explanations is crucial because nobody prevent, nothing prevents us to add a bunch of other constraints on top. And these constraints would reflect the distribution. They would represent, they would somehow succinctly represent uh, the rules by which the universe operates, right? We would say that, okay, this, is this combination is impossible, that combination is impossible, but still check, assuming this background knowledge about the universe we live in, uh, check if this explanation is correct. And the approach is general enough, it will say yes or no. If yes, we, will, we would replace background knowledge and say, okay, even, even if assuming that this background knowledge, we report this counterexample, it's perfectly valid now. Um, <clears throat> um, and we could also count uh, the number of such counterexamples, counter either uh, approximately as we did or exactly. <clears throat> uh, obviously, the problem would be much harder. The comment I had was maybe a bit more to your first half of the talk where you you know you took a data set and then you were designing this ah. logic rules that would explain all the data in this data set. Whereas we know that you know if you want to achieve generalization, sometimes you have to compromise between fitting all the data in your data set and again being able to generalize beyond the data set. So in that case, you would probably build some rules that don't perfectly fit all the data points, but are able to generalize for new points better. Well, you see, when we train models, we typically consider accuracy as well and test accuracy as well. And uh, I only covered in this talk, um, only uh, approaches that train what we call perfect models that respect the training data as much as possible, but there is also a line of work on sparse models when you somewhat uh, trade off accuracy for size, accuracy on training data, mm -hmm. assuming that it will generalize well on unseen data. And that work exists actually. Okay. Uh, so we apply logic there as well. We train a model, <clears throat> we try to make it as small as possible, but we don't care that much anymore about the training accuracy, what we care about the size and generalization. Mm -hmm. generalizability, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was just Thanks. not not covered in this talk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. But how will you do so that's so you again did I understand your comment correctly? The the point is if, if I'm trying to find explanations that nail down exactly exactly all my training data, then I'm probably like over constraining and so I won't generalize. Overfit, that's the concern. Overfitting, overfitting. overfitting the data. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um so this comment applies to interpretable models, right? The models um, we train in logic, they overfit. That's the, the comment about this part. At least this is how I presented it, which is, a, which is true. So the only approach I presented was uh, 
we take the our uh, data set E, uh, and then we say, okay, give me a model that respects it. Should not violate the examples in the training data. But it's possible that training data may have noise, and we don't know what unseen data can look like. And it's in general not a good idea to respect the training data completely, right? So we should sacrifice something if we benefit on unseen, unseen data. And yes, there are approaches to do that as well. And do they, do you get like the, what do you get? Can you write this as some kind of nice max set problems or, or the encodings get not so nice or? Uh, the encoding is okay. <clears throat> Actually, uh, the best results we got was uh, uh, when we trained sparse models and um, those models are usually much smaller than these perfect models that uh, only focus on the training accuracy. Those sparse models are much smaller and they are easier to compute. Um, and sparse decision sets we computed their accuracy, uh, we compared against heuristics like Reaper and CN2. <clears throat> It was it was quite good on, on unseen data on testing data. Okay, and some sense have the same objective because you want to get the, the smaller the model is the better. Yes, the objective is it's the kind more, of the more you like it. <clears throat> yeah. So the objective is twofold. Um, we try to minimize the size, but <clears throat> instead of just focusing on the size, uh, try to say. Okay, we can sacrifice, we can add more literal in the model if the accuracy gets better. If we if we don't, if it doesn't, if this literal, if adding one more literal doesn't help us, then don't add it. This is kind of uh, the, the optimization criteria we consider. Uh, it's probably a little bit more because again, you, you have also the sacrifice of labeling correctly or incorrectly. So if you're mislabel one sample but get your model twice smaller then you probably you know go for it uh, uh right yeah, that's what i meant when i said that if it doesn't if we don't benefit from adding these more literal in the model in terms of accuracy right yeah if we don't get better accuracy by adding it it's then don't add it uh, some gap in act so like yes there is the, yeah. there is a coefficient yeah, yeah. yes mm -hmm. <clears throat> thanks thank you for the questions mm -hmm. so any other questions or comments So I guess the, the regarding to this heuristics, uh, when when you find counterexamples, I guess I didn't quite understand. So so let's see, did you mention when you find the counterexample that shows that this heuristic explanation is wrong, are you finding it like among the training data? Or you're saying that you construct some instance in feature space that sort of yeah, invalidates not, this, yeah, and you're saying that this. This this sort of point in feature space might be a very strange point. Was that what you were saying somehow? Or yes. Well, we don't only consider the training data. Yeah. So that's the power of the approach. Since we have the logical representation that captures the semantics of the classifier, we can reason about its behavior in the entire feature space. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the power. That's the beauty. But it's also one of the issues because. We can compute a counterexample that is meaningless. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, something that never happens in practice. I mean, it is perfectly, absolutely correct from the perspective of the function's behavior, because all in all, this is what we're doing. We, we, we want to see what this function, uh, how, how it operates and why, right? Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> it may be, it may happen that while the example we report as a counterexample, it never appears in practice. It's just unrealistic. And we got such comments uh, in the review saying you don't respect the uh, feature distribution <clears throat> that is hidden in the data set, which is kind of true. Uh, but 
it, 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 it's not a problem, it's not a big issue per se, because as I said, you can, if we have this knowledge given, if we, if we can get the distribution in, in a succinct form of constraints, then we can just plug in those constraints and make all the counterexamples that we report realistic. Mm -hmm. The problem being that you don't have like such a crisp. Yeah, nobody really knows where to get those constraints. And even people in ML, they, they can only get, uh, they can sample in the neighborhood of a, of a given instance, and then they see, okay, this does, didn't happen in, in the sampling we did, but we don't have any guarantees. Maybe it will happen. Um, but yeah, the question is really how to get those constraints. And I think this is uh, one of the ways uh, where we in the area of XAI could uh, proceed. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, thank you again for a great talk, Alexei. Uh, uh, thank, thank you so you much.